First of all, Milun Kutari, many thanks for joining us. Sure. Uh, you've been special rapporteur on the right to housing between 2000 and 2008. Um, sure. It's been a very important mandate that you've assumed then. And I, I would like to ask you um, which of the tools you felt that uh, you used were most important. Special rapporteurs may use country missions, they may use their thematic reports where they can explore in depth certain issues. They also write allegation letters to governments. Mm -hmm. Which of these tools uh, made most uh, difference in your view and were most effective in, in supporting the right to housing in your case? Well, I think that uh, all of them were useful uh, because each one of the tools helped me to sharpen my understanding of what my mandate was and to give it a perspective. So, so for example, the country missions helped me to understand better the issue of the violations of the right to housing, listening to people's voices, visiting areas, and that helped me in my thematic reports to make clear uh, to the Commission and then to the Council what the real obstacles were to the right, which is something I saw as one of my critical roles. But the other, the, you know, and out of that work on the field um, and going through the allegation letters, it became very clear to me that there was some more standard setting that was necessary both in terms of articulating the meaning of the right to housing, so expanding what the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights had done, and my you know, immediate uh, sort of response when I took over the mandate was that we really have to look at the civil and political rights dimension. So the reports helped me to expand the essential elements of the right to include freedom from dispossession, right to participation, and so on. Um, and uh, also, you know, using all that experience, it, I, I realized very quickly that um, what we didn't have at the global level were operational um, guidelines on what to actually do in the case of displacement and forced divisions. Mm -hmm. So the mandate actually helped me to, through the thematic reports, but also, also through regional consultations, uh, missions, to actually uh, get a good understanding of what should be the content of these guidelines. And, and it also helped uh, in that process of communications, developing standards, sharpening the notion of uh, the content of the right, the, the dialogues that I had in, in the field with civil society groups, movements, information that they sent me. Uh, so all, all of that, um, I think what I found the most uh, exhilarating, although as you know, it's a very exhausting <laughs> uh, mandates, but um, was the uh, ability to through you know, your role as rapporteur to go to very remote areas, to meet people, to have access to the highest levels of government and to tell them exactly what was going on. And, and I think that, uh, so, so it's, it's a little bit of all of that. So what, what are the conditions for a mission to be successful? Is it preparation before the mission that is key? Is it the political context that you find in the country? Is it the, the support given to NGOs to identify the, the key issues? Yeah. Uh, How would you provide advice to, to a, a special rapporteur preparing a mission to a country for it to be successful? What are the ingredients? Well, first of all, I think it's very important to develop a criteria on, you know, where do you want to go and what type of situations do you want to see and where, where do you actually want to contribute? So when I became rapporteur, it, it, first of all, it was very clear to me that problem of housing rights and the violations, dispossession, uh, problems of women's rights to land and all that um, were global problems. So I, I sort of made a very quick criteria that I'm going to not only concentrate on what the Commission at that time thought is only going to be looking at countries in the South, but also in the North. So that was one criteria. The second one, which I thought doesn't always work, but where I tried was to make sure that there were strong civil society networks in the countries where I was going so that you know, I got information in advance and I insisted that at least half of the time would be spent exclusively with either the civil society groups or the communities, you know, without there being any uh, government presence. So that, that was another criteria. Uh, the third criteria was that I wanted to look at countries in different political situations. I wanted to look at countries that were democratic, that some that were more authoritarian, of course, if they, you know, agreed to invite me, but also countries that were in a sort of post-conflict situations, countries that were peaceful, democratic situation. So those were some of the criteria. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that um, it's something that, um, I mean, I was the first mandate holder of the right to housing. So I was actually learning 
by doing. And uh, but but my advice would be to have a to not just go anywhere where you're invited, but to have some criteria and and yes, to do adequate uh, preparation. That was very very important. And there, of course, there were some questions about um, you know not always having uh, best support from OHCHR and so on. But I was sort of able to overcome that because luckily for me, I came from a very strong civil society background, so we had already existing networks mm -hmm. that I could I could mm -hmm. rely on. But I, I, I think the role of uh, civil society and independent institutions, National Human Rights Commissions and others, yeah. is absolutely key both to the success of the content of the mission, but even more importantly to the follow-up to the mm -hmm. mission of what comes out of the recommendations. Yeah. Yeah. So you, you um, had a mandate which uh, included the transformation of the Commission on Human Rights into yeah. the Human Rights Council. And when the Human Rights Council was established uh, with a new peer review mechanism, uh, the sure. Universal Periodic Review uh, to monitor states' compliance with their human rights obligations, there were certain concerns expressed that we, as uh, special procedures of the um, Human Rights Council, uh, former Human Rights Commission, um, would have less weight, that our uh, uh, recommendations would be basically um, uh, circumvented or um, um, basically um, not uh, sufficiently supported by the Universal Periodic Review and the Human Rights Council. My impression is that instead it has strengthened us because many of the recommendations that states are made in this UPR process are based on our findings yes. and I'm not sure whether you, you agree that uh, in fact the, the UPR has been um, um, not competing with independent experts monitoring, but instead complementing it. Is it I, I your would, perception? I would completely agree. Yeah. In fact, I would go back before the UPR. When uh, I became a rapporteur, I also decided that I was going to have regular uh, dialogues with the treaty bodies, because I really felt that that uh, complementarity of what a rapporteur could do and mm -hmm. what a treaty body could do was, was very important. And so even when I went on missions, I always asked, so the Committee on ESC Rights had concluding observations, what have you done for that? And whatever I could come up with, I reported back to the treaty bodies. So now that right. process became expanded with the UPR. And I would completely agree with you, with you that the initial anxiety that was there, the fear, um, has not you know, materialized. In fact, um, I've done some writing on this recently because I've been following the UPR very closely. And I think for the first time in the international uh, human rights system, we have a, we have a possibility now of a continuous monitoring of a country's human rights record. So you have the UPR, every four years you have the treaty body, different treaty body reviews, you have one or two rapporteurs visiting uh, every year, you have countries submitting midterm reports on the UPR, and each one strengthens the other. So each recommendation goes into yeah. monitoring, into further recommendations. So I think I, I think the UPR has been uh, very, very useful, and I'm, I'm actually hopeful that in the evolution of the UPR becoming better, that the work done by the special rapporteurs will become a routine part of the, the body of work that is before the governments when they ask the questions and what they follow up, that it won't be just left to a particular government's you know, choice of whether they want to use that. Okay, so one last question. Uh, one of the many legacies you, you left uh, is a set of basic principles and guidelines on development-based um, evictions and displacement uh, mm -hmm. adopted uh, or presented in 2007. Mm -hmm. um, what um, follow-up was given to these um, basic principles and guidelines and what would you say are conditions for these normative um, advances in the understanding of the concrete implications of the right to housing to be, to be successful and in influential? Well, uh, I think there are many sort of conditions, but I've recently been sort of collecting information, reviewing progress on the implementation of the guidelines, and there, there wasn't any formal uh, follow-up with the uh, within the UN system, uh, which, as you know, is one of the main weaknesses uh, generally of U uh, rapporteur work or treaty body work. Um, but but there was considerable follow-up uh, by you know civil society groups taking up the issue, by lawyers taking up. The guidelines by courts uh, using them in their in their judgments uh, by many groups translating them into local languages so we have them in 19 languages now um, they're they're being increasingly used and I think that um, 
I mean, my overall assessment is a little difficult for me to make that is that uh, they've been tremendously useful uh, in terms of, you know, setting a global standard. But I think my initial idea that they would be operational has turned out to be the correct one, that we, there was no point in producing another set of theoretical conceptual guidelines, but something that would sort of step by step explain what right. precautions so, are so, taking. So if governments understand it's a, it's a way to uh, basically be um, more effective in um, operating within the rules, yes. if they see it's useful as a guide uh, right. for them to use, then they will, they will rely on it. Yeah, and in fact now um, I know, for example, that uh, the, 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 you know, the guidelines on extreme poverty and human rights that are going to be presented and adopted in a few weeks, uh, Magdalena Spildeva's guidelines, uh, have learned from these experiences, right. not only from the evictions guidelines, but the IDP ones and the others to say, okay, so let's create an instrument uh, that is useful and that, you know, is, is something that, that, operation. that people will use. Yeah. And one of the ways of doing that, which is what I tried to do also, was the content actually came, some of the content at least came from the ground, from the insights of the people who are, you know, who are struggling against evictions and the people who are coming up with their own solutions, but all within the context of the human rights instruments, which is as you know, very, very broad. So it allows us to do work which is not necessarily, and this was a selling point in a way, is not necessarily new standards, but it's interpreting yep. existing standards and elaborating on them. That's often how human rights make progress, by right. restating uh, right. general principles in, in concrete settings and giving them new meanings. Yeah. But I think that the role of rapporteurs is in that sense different from the role of treaty bodies, because the treaty bodies can elaborate in a sort of a general global sense through general comments and general recommendations. But I think a rapporteur needs to go further because I, I see the role of rapporteurs, the, the sort of uniqueness and critical importance of the role is a practical role. We, we are there to understand the problems and to provide solutions. Practical and, and, and linked to developments on the ground That's that right. we can visit, which That's is right. very unique and which yeah. is a privilege the fact uh, part, yeah. that the, the experts sitting in treaty bodies may not have. That's right. Yeah. So thank you very much. Okay. It has been uh, very useful. All thank the best, you. Yeah.